Well, good evening. Welcome to the Sunday night service at Lakeview Baptist Church. Good to have you all here with us tonight, ready to serve the Lord. Let's go ahead and get started tonight with some scenes. Brother Dave comes and leads us, Dave. Let's all take our song books and turn to number 243, I Am Resolved. Number 243, I Am Resolved. Let's all stand as we sing. Resolve no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have a Lord my sight. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest time. Resolve to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strive. He is the true one, he is the just one, he has the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus Christ. last. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. greatest, highest, I will come to thee. May we sing? Please remain standing for opening prayer. <clears throat> People often mistake stubbornness for resolve. Stubbornness is I will do what I want. Resolve is I will not be swayed from doing what God wants. It's a very distinct difference there. Stubbornness is about I. Resolve is about God. Resolve is about the end product. Tonight, let us be resolved to get closer to the Lord. Let us be resolved to do what God would have us to do. And let us be resolved to put away stubbornness and pride. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your spirit. Father, we do pray tonight that you bless in our time together, that, Lord, we would resolve ourselves to follow you and to be obedient to you in all things. Father, we just pray your blessing on this service tonight, that your name might be lifted up and glorified. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And it's good to be here tonight. I hope you all had a good afternoon today and uh, ready to have a good service tonight. Don't forget, Tuesday night at 7 o'clock is uh, ladies' uh, Ladies Fellowship, couldn't remember what it's called for a minute. Ladies Fellowship meeting here at the church at 7 o'clock on Tuesday. Midweek service, 7 o'clock on Wednesday. And then Saturday morning, uh, door knocking and visitation at 10.30. And then, of course, next Sunday, our Memorial Day picnic, uh, cookout after church, and then an afternoon service. So there'll be no evening service next Sunday. Just be the afternoon service. And uh, that will not be live streamed. That will just be for here. And at that time, we'll be bidding farewell to Julia as she goes off to get married the next week. And so on Saturday, June the 4th, you're invited to come to the wedding at Beth Haven Baptist Church in uh, Oklahoma City on Western and 120th Street. Uh, let's see. Then don't forget, coming up uh, at the end of June, we've got uh, David's high school graduation. And then in July, July the 6th, we have the singing group from West Coast Baptist College that will be here for the midweek service. Uh, you want to be a part of that. Okay, plan, start saving your money to buy some CDs and some books and things that they'll have uh, here for sale that night. And we'll have a good time of fellowship with the group from West Coast. I think that's it for announcements. So Dave, come and lead us in another song. 
Let's all stand for our last song this evening. Turn to number 215, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Number 215, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Thank you for seeing. You may be seated. Take your Bibles. Turn to the book of Titus, chapter 1. Book of Titus, chapter 1. How many of you ever heard somebody called a Cretan? <clears throat> it's, uh, typically is a uh, derogatory term to call someone. There is historically a geographical place known as Crete, and the residents of Crete are alternately known as Cretans or Cretans. And the word Cretan has become synonymous with a person who is slovenly, a person who is lazy, a person who is a ne'er-do-well, if you will, uh, ruffians, uh, burglars, crooks, outlaws are often referred to in history as Cretans. Tonight, we see the Apostle Paul justify the use of that term on some people. And it's quite a shocking statement, really, when we look at what Paul says uh, about the Cretans. But yet we see the beauty of the redemptive grace of God that even a Cretan can be saved. Amen? And so let's look tonight here in our text at what to do with a Cretan. What to do with a Cretan. Picking up in verse 10 of Titus chapter 1, Last Sunday night, we looked in the first nine verses, and we saw the Apostle Paul's problem that he had with, uh, that he had to send Titus to set things in order. And now tonight, beginning in verse 10, we see why they had to set things in order. Verse 10, for there are many unruly. We'll just stop right there for a second and ask the Lord 
to bless our time. Father, we do thank you tonight for your word. We do pray tonight you'd help us to look at your word by your spirit, that, Father, we would discern what it is to be unruly in your house. Father, I pray for your power as I preach. May the words I speak be your words. Father, tonight, help us not to be of like of those Cretans. Father, help us instead to be like Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this matter of being unruly, we, <clears throat> you know, we, we usually assign words like unruly to particular conduct. A person is considered to be unruly if they are restless and, and creating noise uh, during services. You know, nothing is louder in a church service than a lady trying to unwrap a cough drop from her purse quietly. Uh, all women seem to have the same idea, if I do it slowly, no one notices how loud this paper is crinkling. Let me tell you, ladies, everybody notices. It would be easier if you'd just say, excuse me a minute, and just do it fast and get it over with, all right? The long, drawn-out, 12-minute peeling of the breath mint or the candy or whatever is not helping the mood of the service, okay? Uh, in, in fact, arguably, you could maybe go another 20 minutes without that and just sit and listen to the message. That's just my opinion. But anyways, but uh, we, we think of things that are disruptive as being unruly. You know, if, if uh, a few weeks ago now, uh, heard there was an incident at another church here in town where uh, an emotionally disturbed person had gone into the services and was making a lot of noise, was interrupting the preacher while he was trying to preach, was making a big commotion. That particular church is a large church. They actually have a police presence there for security in their services, and so the police officers had to come in and take the man out in handcuffs in the middle of the service. And uh, well, I've, I've always wanted to have that happen in a church service. Where, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but it, was, it was unruly. And, and the pastor handled it, I thought, incredibly graciously. You know, he turned the audience's attention to himself, and, the, and to the message, he said, look, there's a man over here that's just having a problem. We're not going to let the devil interfere with the message today. So let's just take a moment. We're going to pray for him. We're going to pray for our spirit. And we're just going to go on. And that's what he did. And, uh, and so the devil was rebuked and not able to continue disrupting the service. Police helped also uh, in taking, the, <laughs> taking out the devil and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and not allowing him to disrupt the service. But when we think it's only being Unruly, that's what we usually think of, like a kid making noise or somebody talking during the service and making noise and interrupting the service. But let me tell you, there are things spiritually much more insidious than the loud piece of candy or the crying child, which are unruly. And that's what the Apostle Paul is addressing here. Paul is not addressing people's decorum in the congregation during the message as much as he is addressing people's hearts and what they ought to be loving and feeling and knowing about Christ in, in, in the spiritual realm. So he says here in verse 10, there are many unruly. He goes on and he says this, and vain talkers and deceivers. So, so we know that the word vain refers to an emptiness. In other words, they, they speak uh, good sounding words but they are void of meaning. They are empty of anything good. Um, you know, I, I, uh, a few years back, I, for a very short time, I started keeping a, a blog on our church website when we were in Wisconsin. And the reason why I stopped doing it is just because um, it's a lot of work to keep up with a blog. They have to write something you know, weekly or whatever, and I and I just I didn't have the time to do it and work in my secular job as well, but but I remember I, I would try to on my blog I would try to relate something humorous from my viewpoint and then tie in a spiritual application, and I was talking about the preserved word of God and how long it has lasted, and I and this was back when the Hostess Company Hostess Cake Company was going. Bankrupt. Y'all remember that sad, dark time in our nation's history when the hostess company went bankrupt and the, 
the, the, the flour mills went silent and the, 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 the place that makes the cream defrosting was dark and shuttered and locked. And oh, it was a sad, the nation mourned and wept. But I was reading an article that they had done research on Twinkies. Now, I like Twinkies. If you're not familiar with the Twinkie, it's a golden sponge cake filled with a delicious vanilla cream. And, uh, and, and, and it just, you know, you can swallow them whole. Just put them in, and whoop, like that, and they just slide right down. Uh, they're delicious, and they're so good. I like Twinkies. Everybody likes to. If you don't like Twinkies, I don't even think you're American. You're probably a communist spy or something. Uh, but, but I like Twinkies. Well, we heard they were going to stop making Twinkies, and I was reading about them, and they said they'd done research, and because of the makeup of the Twinkies, that they would last on a shelf, I forget if it was 20 years or 40 years or however long it was, that it would be just as fresh in that amount of time if left in its wrapper as it was on the day it was made. And, uh, and I think that's genius. Everybody's like, oh, that's terrible. I think that's brilliant. And I, and I talked about how the Word of God will be around forever. And, and if I'm still alive in 40 years, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to read the preserved Word of God and I'll probably have a Twinkie along with it. You know? uh, uh, but, 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 but listen, you can eat a lot of Twinkies and, and, and get very sick. And you go to the doctor, the doctors say, well, are you eating right? You say, well, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm eating regularly and eating full meals. And the doctor said, well, what kind of meals are you eating? Well, the Twinkies. Well, well, Twinkies for dessert, right? Well, yeah. And what else? Twinkies. Well, how many Twinkies are you eating? Well, I usually have like 10 or 12 Twinkies for a, a supper meal. And then I'll have like, you know, eight or 10 for lunch. And, and you know, breakfast, I just usually only have about four or five uh, Twinkies. Right? I just eat Twinkies. That's all I eat all day long. The doctor's probably going to check me into the emergency room. Now, the idea there is if I eat enough preservatives, I'll live forever. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Those Twinkies are delicious. They taste good, but they are void. They are empty of nutritional value, right? Uh, they, they don't have the vitamins and the protein and the things that your body needs to function. In fact, they may well be the antithesis of the things your body needs to function. Uh, they're, they're vain. They're vain. Here he says here, these are vain talkers, these unruly people. They've got a lot of words to say. They sound good, but they're empty of spiritual benefit. In fact, he goes on, he says this, they are deceivers. It's an important note to make because nobody today wants to be accused of being judgmental, right? Uh, I mean, we're all kind of running afraid today of the, of the, the, the modernistic churches labeling us as, uh, um, hang on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get wound up here. Uh, the modernistic churches labeling us as legalists or, or you know, you, you harsh, judgmental, hateful Baptists. But let me tell you something. In my book, there's nothing harsher, there's nothing more hateful than a purveyor of untruths when they know it's not true. And that's what Paul is talking about here. They're unruly. They're disrupting the local church with what they know is not true. We want to we try to give them the benefit of the doubt. We want to say, well, you know, they're just misled. No, they're not misled. They're deceivers. The deceiver knows the truth and tries to get an unaware person to think otherwise than the truth. That's why they're unruly. They're, they're, they're disruptive. Paul says they're vain. They're empty of anything good in their talking. <clears throat> I'm telling you, that bothers me. That bothers me. I, I am far, far, so far removed from being, even in my opinion, adequate. But, I, but I, this one thing I do really try, I do really try to only ever preach what God has given me. I, I really try not to ever, you know, preach on, on or preach at anybody or, or preach on anybody's, you know, pet thing that I want them to get right. The only time, you know, there is a place for what we call pulpit counseling, 
where you know you know the situation and the Holy Spirit gives liberty for you to address it in the sermon. There's, there's a time and a place for that. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about I really try to only ever preach the truth of the Word of God. And listen, if you ever want to go and check anything I've ever said in a sermon, know this, anything I've ever said in a sermon, doctrinally, I can back it up with the Word of God. If I can't back it up with the Word of God, I'm not going to say it because my worst fear is looking like a fool. So I really try. I try hard. And I know men who try even harder than I do and are even more successful at it than I am. But to have some who go out there and pervade themselves, portray themselves as something special, something new, and they're just wicked, unruly deceivers. That bothers me. That bothers me. And some will say, well, you're just old-fashioned. I thank God that I'm old-fashioned. As we read this morning in the book of Psalms in our devotion time, these lines that have fallen to me, this goodly heritage that I have. I remember hearing a, a, a Park Sutton preach a message one time from that text, and he talked about umpiring a baseball game. And I can relate to this because I've done quite a bit of umpiring of baseball games. And before a baseball game, they come out there with the chalk, and they make what they call the batter's box around home plate. And there's a big section on the left side of the plate and a big section on the right side of the plate and a section behind the plate. Behind the plate's for the catcher and the umpire. And then on the sides of the plate are for the batters. And the first batter that comes up, the first thing he does before he even sees a pitch, you know, baseball is the only sport in the world that starts with the timeout. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, the first batter up, the first thing he does, he walks up to the box and he stops, and he looks at the umpire, and he says, time, Blue. And the umpire will hold up his hand, go time. And then that batter will take one foot, and he'll step in, usually at the back of the batter's box, and then balancing on his other foot, he'll take that first foot, and he'll start doing like this, and brushing out the lines of the batter's box. That's the first thing he does. Before a pitch has been thrown, before he's swung the bat, he tries to Mark, the or mark out the lines of the batter's box so that the umpire can't see where he's really supposed to be standing. I remember one time I had a young man step in. He was probably 18 or 20 years old, and this guy had been drafted by a Division I school. He was a well-known superstar baseball player. I mean, this kid was a five-tool player. He had speed. He had power. He could work the glove. He could throw. He could hit. He could do everything. And he was going to go a long ways in the majors. And this kid went to step in, and he called time blue, and he started wiping out the lines. And I stopped him. I said, what do you think you're doing to my batter's box? He said, what? I said, what do you think you're doing to my batter's box? And he just looked at me. I said, don't you realize that's my batter's box? That I had those lines put there? You don't get to wipe out those lines. Those lines are there. For me, not for you. You don't get to come along and, and erase them. And I was just giving him a hard time. And he, he was like, you know. <laughs> but, but it's true. You know, what right did he have to erase the lines that the rules say are supposed to be there? What right do we have as believers to come along and erase the lines of the heritage of the Word of God that has been entrusted to us? Only one who is a vain talker a deceiver, an unruly person would want to come in and wipe out the lines. So we have this. Paul says in verse 10, especially they of the circumcision. What they were dealing with in that day were the Judaizers who came in and said, yes, fine, salvation by grace. You Gentiles, you can be saved as long as you also follow the law. And we, if you've been with us on our journey through the book of Galatians in recent Wednesdays, you know the Apostle Paul went to great lengths refuting and disputing with the Galatian believers how the law did nothing to save the Jews. It could only do less to save the Gentiles. 
So why would they leave behind the grace of God in favor of the law? Uh, but that was what the Judaizers wanted, was, them, was the Gentiles to leave the grace of God and, and to embrace uh, the law as if the, as if the Jews had it right all along before Jesus Christ. And so Paul says here, especially they of the circumcision, especially the Judaizers have come in and they have vain words and deceitful words. But then look what it says here in verse 11. <clears throat> Whose mouths must be stopped. We'll get to that in just a minute. It's not a, a physical confrontation but it's a spiritual confrontation. And let me just say this real quickly before we move on, and then we'll come back to that in a minute. You know, too often we lose that battle because we think we can be physically intimidating instead of, instead of being spiritual in the matter. And spiritually, you don't have to be intimidated. Spiritually, all you have to do is speak the truth in love. You speak the truth in love, there is no argument against it. So Paul says they have to have their mouths stopped. Who are they? Who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. To make it known, these unrulies do not take away single people. They take away whole houses. They'll get one person from that house, and it's, it's not surprising, really. <laughs> but sometimes it is a little surprising. But before long, that one person has become everybody in that household. The devil knows he may never get mom and dad to relinquish their doctrine, but if he can get Junior to go someplace else, mom and dad will maybe follow. Will maybe follow. You know, moms and dads can be real susceptible to the draw of grandkids. I know a man, I don't know him personally, I know of a man. He was a pastor of an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist church. Standards, music standards, dress standards, a godly man. I mean, I've, I certainly thought better of him than what it turned out. And his daughter and son-in-law got crossways and left the church and went to some new evangelical, modernistic church started living like the world and looking like the world and dressing like the world. They go to church on Saturday nights so it doesn't interfere with their Sundays, which that really puts the Lord first, doesn't it? We won't even give him his own day now. You can have our spare time on Saturday. That pastor, because of his grandkids, left his pulpit and he and his wife went and joined that other church. God help us that the devil would subvert entire houses. Three generations in that case. In one fell swoop. How? Vain talkers, unrulies, disruptive members. And what are they doing? They're teaching things which they ought not. That seems kind of simplistic. <laughs> but it's true. They're teaching things. That, they're simply teaching things which aren't true. They're not true. I, the more I see in the news about public schools, the more I say to Christian parents, the, the biggest mistake you could make today would be to put your little Johnny and little Susie in kindergarten in the government's control. Because they're not teaching little Johnny and little Susie to read and write. They're not teaching them arithmetic and history. They're teaching little Johnny and little Susie that, you know, the teacher is, is not feeling well today because the teacher was uh, in, a, in a debauchery fest with a group of people last night. You think that's not happening? I, I hear all the excuses, all of them. Oh, well, pastor, it's not like that in our school district. Our school district is good. I have news for you. Your school district you may think is good, but I guarantee you there is some teacher in that school district that's like that. And I will guarantee you this, even if every teacher in your school district is perfect, they're in a system which denies God. Teaching things they ought not. How about the local church? Well, I know we're not supposed to have, you know, ladies in charge of things and deacons and stuff, but, 
you know, we just don't have any men to do it, so I guess we'll just have to do it this way. Well, teaching things which we ought not. Well, I know that technically that guy's not really qualified to be a deacon or to be a pastor because he's been divorced, but, you know, who else is going to do it? Somebody who's qualified. And if nobody's qualified, then maybe God's not in it to begin with. Because if, if, if God is in it, certainly he can provide a qualified individual to fill that office. Rather than making excuses and rather than trying to justify our wickedness and our laziness and our sin, maybe what we ought to do is say, hey, instead of teaching things that aren't true, what we're going to say is, this is truth, here we stand, and I will not be moved from that truth. That's resolve, by the way. <laughs> That's not stubbornness. Teaching things that they ought not, and why? For filthy lucre's sake. Now, filthy lucre doesn't have to just be ill-gotten money. Filthy lucre could be ill-gotten prestige. Filthy lucre could be just simply robbing God of the glory that is due to him. But that's the motivation for these vain talkers. Look at verse 12. This is where the title comes in. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. I looked this up. Um, <clears throat> the name of this Greek philosopher, um, and, and it, uh, I wish I would have written it down, but it's about 327 letters long. Uh, but, but, <laughs> but there's an actual Greek philosopher. This was his quote about the Cretan people that they are, they are slow bellies, they're always liars, they're lazy, they're just a, a reprehend. I mean, this was not a very politically correct statement. And then look what Paul says in verse 13, this witness is true. Paul says, oh yeah, yeah, I've been around those Cretans. They are something else. You, you, I mean, if the, you, know, you know how to tell if a Cretan's lying? His lips are moving. Because you see, when you talk, your lips are moving, so if they're talking at all, they're probably lying. This is their reputation. They're slow bellies. They're, they're just simply lazy. You know, what, you know what lazy is? Lazy is not, oh, man, I've worked hard. It's Saturday. I want to sleep in for a couple hours. Lazy is, you know what? That, that grass is on fire, but I just can't bother to get up and go put it out. That's lazy. That's lazy. See, that's what the Cretans were known for. Just a, an ability to work, but a refusal to work. An ability to tell the truth, but a refusal to tell the truth. Why? For gain. For gain. Paul says, this is true. This is a true witness for them. So what do you do? Well, there have to be consequences. They were liars and lazy in practice as well as reputation. And so Paul says, they have to be rebuked. Verse 13, wherefore, rebuke them Sharply. Rebuke them sharply. My oldest daughter, when she was a youngster, three, four, five years old, she would occasionally show forth her mom's side of the family and she would misbehave. <clears throat> And all I had to do with her, I didn't have to say her name. I didn't have to yell at her. I didn't have to threaten her. All I had to do with her was do like this. Snap my fingers and point at her and give her the look. And she would dissolve into a puddle of repentant goo. I mean, you never saw a kid more repentant than my daughter, Trisha. And then we had a son. And um, to say he was not like that would be an understatement. You know, I mean, you'd give him a spanking and, and you'd feel like your arm was going to fall off and he would just look at you like, that's all you got? It's, it's okay, Dad, I know you're old. I mean, I mean he was just, and, and even so, I, I remember he had a, a, uh, developed a habit of sucking his thumb when he was, when he was really small. And, uh, and my wife was trying to break him of the habit. He was, I, I don't remember how old he was, about two maybe or three years old. And she was trying to break him of the habit of sucking his thumb. 
which we eventually did break him. I don't want anybody to think he still does it, but at least that I know of. That's his wife's problem if he does now. But, but he, he, we didn't break him without it. But she, we tried everything. They make this stuff you could put drops on the kid's thumb. to make him, We put that on there. He would lick that off and just keep sucking his thumb. And, and so Pam had read a, an article, you take the kid's thumb and you wet it and you stick it in a jar of red pepper. And it's really hot and spicy. And, they won't be, and so she did that with his thumb. And he put his thumb in his mouth and he said, <laughs> but he kept his thumb in his mouth. I mean, this kid, he was stubborn. He was stubborn. You couldn't just give him a soft rebuke. You had to rebuke him sharply. He got to be old enough to ride a bicycle. And, I mean, that he, was, he had either not enough sense or not enough something, but he was not afraid to do anything with that bicycle. And he would ride it right down the middle of the road. One time I was riding down the middle of the road, I said, I said, son, you have to watch for cars. And so sitting on the bike in the middle of the road, he turned around behind himself like this and was watching behind him as he was still riding down the middle of the road, watching for cars behind him mindless of any cars coming in front of them. I just, I said to my wife, I said, we need to have more kids because I don't think that one's going to make it. But, <clears throat> um, I mean, he was, he was something. He was something stubborn. You had to really rebuke him sharply, sharply. Paul says here to the Cretans, rebuke them sharply. He said, I already know that you can't just mention, hey, guys, listen, we need to do better than that. That's not going to work. Paul said, you're going to have to spiritually withstand them to the face like Paul did to Peter. Paul said, you're going to have to go to them in love and in meekness, but with the truth of the word of God and say, here I stand. I will not be moved. And they will have to back down because they have no truth. So you rebuke them sharply. Why? That they may be sound in the faith. The goal of rebuking them sharply is not that you can be vindicated. The goal of rebuking them sharply is not to kick them out. The goal of rebuking them sharply is that they might be restored in Jesus Christ, that they would be sound in the faith. But look, look what it says in verse 14 here. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. This is the first thing we need to rebuke, a turning from the truth turning from the truth. There is, listen to this tonight, there is no justification for turning away from sound doctrine. None. I don't care what your great-grandma believed that's so important to you. Let me tell you something. Your great-grandma might have been a great lady, but she never died for anybody since. So I don't care what she believed. And if, it's, if, if you're willing to go to hell for eternity because great-grandma is in hell for eternity, that's misplaced. That's ridiculous and absurd. There's no reason for false doctrine. Well, you know, you can't preach or you can't say to people that they can't be saved by baptism because a lot of people, that's how they were raised. Then they need to be unraised from it. Not, not harshly, not meanly and mean-spiritedly, but in love because you don't want them to go to hell thinking that they're saved because they got baptized. Make them a twofold child of the devil at that point. I mean, how devastating that that one would go to eternity thinking that they were saved and then get there and find out their faith was misplaced. Their faith was in a work, not in Christ. So those that turn from the truth, Paul says, rebuke them sharply. Rebuke them sharply. Verse 15. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. We rebuke the ones who turn from the truth. We rebuke the ones who defile the mind and the conscience. We rebuke the ones who say, listen, your sin, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. You know, I've shared this story before. I was, I was telling somebody about this this last week, and it just, it just cracks me up. <clears throat> I had a friend. He was single, and he was about 50 years old. And he was from 
well, he was, I don't even want to say where he's from, but he, uh, he needed to get married. I mean, he just desperately, desperately, desperately needed to get married. You know, he, he lacked anything about him that was, you know, social, that a wife would bring to a husband. He didn't have that. He didn't know how to do it. And I was over at his house working on a car with him, and, and he was getting frustrated. He said, let's go inside and get something to drink. So we went inside, and, and he said, have a seat. And I look, and the only furniture he's got was a weight bench. That was his sofa. And then a couple of those old vinyl lawn chairs with the you know, strings of vinyl between the little aluminum things. And I said, you know, I'm okay. I'll stand. He's like, okay. He said, you want something to drink? And I said, sure. What do you got? And he just looked surprised like he wasn't expecting me to take him up on it. And he says, well, I don't know. And he goes in the kitchen, and he, he opens the refrigerator, and there's a thing of grape juice. He goes, I got grape juice. I said, okay, well, that sounds good. Let's have some grape juice. He's like, really? I said, and you offered it, so yeah, let's, let's have grape juice. He opens up a couple of cabinets like he's hoping glasses are in there. There's no glass. There's nothing in those cabinets. And he stands there for a second, and he looks, and he's got on top of his refrigerator these little jars, little canning jars like people would use to keep screws and nuts and bolts and greasy tools on top of the refrigerator. He had those, and they were full with screws and nuts and bolts. He took one of those down, two of those down, and he dumped out all the screws, nuts, and bolts. He took his T-shirt and wiped out the jar so it would be, you know, clean, and then filled it with grape juice. And he's like, there you go. I'm used to a level of cleanliness that is higher than that. Um, you know, I'm the guy that the dishwasher gets done, and I take dishes out, and I look at them, and I put them back on the dirty dish side because they got to be washed again. You know, they're just, they're not, they didn't get it all the first time. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the guy at a restaurant that the first thing I do when I sit down is I open up my silverware, and I look at it, and I inspect it to see. And if there's any smudges, anything, no, I'm not, I'm not. I look at my glass. Do I see lipstick prints on the glass? I'm not drinking out of that. I, I require a level of cleanliness. You know what I mean? I, I, there's, there's anything else is going. I, was, I sat down one day. I fixed a cup of coffee and a bowl of cereal, and I sat down to have my breakfast, and one of the dogs walked by and decided this would be a good place to shake. And so that dog stood next to me and shook real violently, and you know, I see dog hair going all through the air, and I looked down at my food, and I'm like, no! I just took everything and threw it away. It, needs to, it, it can't be defiled. I need some cleanliness. Let me, let me tell you, God demands cleanliness a lot more than I do. God demands a spiritual cleanliness. And there is, listen to this tonight, there is no spiritual cleanliness with the presence of sin. And so what, he, what he's saying here is, look, the rebuking is for the one who turns from the truth, but it's also for the one who would defile minds and consciences by saying there is a place for sin in the life of a believer. Paul says, bear in mind, they're liars. They're slow bellies, and they must be rebuked. Well, look at verse 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. That's pretty harsh. It's bad enough, Paul says, hey, you know how that one guy called them liars and slow bellies? He's right. They also turn from the truth. They, they defile everything that they touch, and their disobedience makes them abominable and reprobate. Reprobate. Wow. So how do you handle a creek? What do you do with them? You rebuke them. You stand firm in the truth. You follow after obedience and purity in Christ Jesus. You make no place for falsehoods. You can't be lazy and off guard and just let going by in the, in the scheme of life. Paul says you've got to be awake and alert and ready, and you've got to be ready to stand. So Paul's telling Titus here, as he goes about to set things in order in these places, you've got to be watching Titus. I mean, he says to the churches here today, listen, you've got to be watching. 
those that would disrupt, those that would be unruly in the church. Try to restore them. But at the end of the day, if you have nothing else you can do, we already know from the book of Matthew what you do with one who's unruly. You put them out. You don't, you don't do that lightly. You don't do that without cause. But let me tell you something. When there is cause, you better be willing to do it. I have heard too many preachers say, well, I couldn't, I couldn't discipline any of the people in my church. I love them too much. I heard a story one time. I don't remember. I think this might have been Bill Rice Sr. But he was talking about disciplining his children. And uh, they had a dog. His kids had a dog. And the dog was notorious for running away from home and chasing cars on the highway past their, their house. And, so, and the kids were just terrified that their dog was going to get away and, and get hit by a truck or something on the road. And so the kids would really get after their dog. I mean, if their dog tried to get away, they would just, I mean, almost borderline be mean to the dog because they were so, you know, urgently trying to discipline the dog not to do those things. And one day, this preacher heard his daughter really giving it to that dog. You bad dog, naughty, naughty, naughty dog. You know, you should not do that. And, and you must never do that again, blah, blah, blah. And, and the preacher went in and he said, hey, hey. I thought you loved that dog. And she said, well, Daddy, I do love that dog. He said, no, you don't love that dog. If you love that dog, you wouldn't be yelling at him like that. And she got big tears in her eyes. She said, but Daddy, I do love him. I don't want him to get hurt. That's why I get after him. And then she realizes, you know, she got set up. And the guy says, that's right. I love you. That's why I get after you when you do wrong. I don't want you to get hurt. Paul says, listen, God loves us. He doesn't want us to get hurt spiritually. So if a sharp rebuke is what it takes to stop being a cretin, then so be it. Let's get some sharp rebukes. Father, I pray you'd work in our hearts tonight. Lord, let there, let there not be need for sharp rebuke. Let us simply repent and follow after Christ. Father, I pray tonight that you'd have your way in our hearts and our lives. With head bowed, heads bowed and eyes closed tonight, First question is this, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? For those here and at home, the same question, have you, has there been a time that you put your faith in the blood of Christ to save you? If not, tonight, make it, the, make it your, your purpose tonight. Make this the night, the night that you come to Christ and receive his gift of eternal life. The Bible says all you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, and thou shalt be saved. So simply praying and confessing your need. Lord, I'm a sinner and need to be saved. But professing faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and His death, burial, and resurrection being sufficient to pay for your sins. The Bible says if you believe and confess, you'll be saved. So tonight, put your faith in Christ. Confess your need to be saved to Him and accept His gift of everlasting life. For those that know Christ as Savior, let me just encourage you to hold to the truth. Let me encourage you tonight not to be a cretin, not to be turned aside, not to be lazy, not to be a liar and a deceiver. Don't be moved by liars and deceivers. Recognize them with the gift of the Holy Spirit that you have in you and rebuke them, not in pride, not in vanity, but in love. Rebuke them that they might be restored to Christ as well. Whatever area God's working in your heart tonight, let him have his way. Father, I pray tonight you'd have your way in us. I pray, Lord, that you would make us pliable and submissive to you. Father, we just pray your blessing on this invitation. The decisions would be made for your glory and honor, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand, heads bowed, and eyes closed as the invitation hymn plays? If tonight, if you don't know Christ as Savior, now is the time. You at home, now is the time to put your faith in the blood of Christ. You here tonight, the altar is open. Do business with God tonight. You have a decision to make for, for the Lord? Make it. You've been following after the ways of Cretans tonight? Put that aside. Follow Christ. Oh, friend, tonight, let him have his way. There is nothing this world can offer. There is nothing Satan 
can offer that would ever come close to what Jesus offers. Because he offers life. And nobody else can offer that. Satan can only offer death. The world can only offer destruction. But Jesus gives life. Won't you come to him tonight? Let him have his way. The final verse. Where he leads, I'll follow. Where he leads, I'll follow. Tonight, follow Christ. Don't follow after the vain talkers and deceivers. Don't follow after the Cretans. Follow after Jesus and his truth. Let him have his way tonight. Thank you for being here this evening. Good to be in God's house as always. Remember Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, ladies here at the church for the ladies' fellowship. Wednesday night at 7 for the midweek service. And next Saturday morning, 10.30 visitation and Sunday morning regular services here. Uh, and then Sunday afternoon, of course, the special time. So don't forget to be in place for the opportunities to serve this week. Until next week, for those of you at home, thank you for joining us. We hope you can come back again. As always, if I can help you in any way, please call me here at the church at 405-651-2500. You can email me, pastor at lbcnewcastle.org. Send me a message on the internet after church. We'll get back to you tonight yet. Thanks for being a part of our services today. As always, God bless you, and you're dismissed.